Hello students, I am creating this video to recall the topics we covered between the first and the second exam. The plan is to discuss one example from each of this topic to recall the main idea. Let's begin this uh, review by recalling the topic of continuity. Here is one question regarding continuity. Let's say I give you a function for f of x equal to x square minus 9 divided by x square minus x minus 6. We would like to ask the following three questions. Question number one. Is f of 3 defined? What is the value? of the function at x equal to 3. Is the function defined at x equal to 3? Number 2. Does the limit x approaches to 3 f of x exist? If yes, give the value. If no, give the reason. And then number 3. Is f of x continuous? at x equal to 3. Again, understand what this question is asking us, right? The first question is asking us to compute the exact value of the function at input 3 if defined. The second question is asking you to make a prediction where the function should go as x approaches to 3 from the either side of 3, from the left of 3 or from the right of 3. And the third question is really asking you, is this prediction matching with the exact value of the function at that input? In other words, is the function continuous, right? Let's check this carefully. So here is the solution. So in order to answer the first question, I'm going to plug x equal to 3 into my function. See what happens. I get 3 squared minus 9 divided by 3 square minus 3 minus 6. I want you to notice that in the numerator I get 9 minus 9, in the denominator I get 9 minus 9. All right. It should be clear that the denominator turns out to be 0, so this function is undefined. So f at 3 is undefined because the denominator is 0. Right? Okay, now let's answer the next question. Does the limit exist as x approaches to 3 for our function? In order to answer that, we'll have to apply the limit x approaches to 3 on our function. It is clear that plugging x equal to 3 into the function gives me 0 in the top and 0 in the bottom. So this is indeed an indeterminate form of the limit. Remember, we have three tools in our tool set to handle indeterminate form. Rationalization, factorization, and algebraic simplification. Rationalization is recommended for radicals. Factorization is recommended for polynomials. And algebraic simplification is recommended for expression involving rationals. It should be clear that in the top and the bottom both, I have polynomials. So factorization is a technique to use. Let's factorize the top and the bottom completely. If you factorize the top using difference of two square formula, you get x minus 3, x plus 3. If you factorize the bottom using quadratic formula, you get x minus 3 times x plus 2. Okay. As you see, factorization did a trick. It gave us an opportunity to see a problematic portion as a factor in the top and the bottom. When I say problematic portion, I really mean the factor that gives you 0 in the top and 0 in the bottom when you plug x equal to 3. Once it is visible, get rid of it. And then you apply the limit on x plus 3 over x plus 2. Now that the back factor is gone, you will not be getting 0 over 0 form again. 
that. So we are safe. Now it is safe to apply the limit. Be sure at the moment you replace x by 3, you should drop that limit symbol. Right? I end up getting 6 over 5. So the prediction says that when I reach, when I go close to 3 from left or the right side of my function, my function should go close to 6 over 5. The exact value of the function at 3 is undefined. Prediction is not matching with the exact value, so function is not continuous. Right? So we answer this uh, third part of our question that uh, f is not continuous. Be sure you know uh, how to uh, identify continuity of the function. Okay. All right. Let's move on and let's recall uh, the next topic. We talked about two types of rates, average rate of change and instantaneous rate of change. Let's try to <coughs> compute, try to see an example involving both of them. We use instantaneous rate of change to define something very important in calculus. We use it to define the derivative of the function. So instead of doing examples of instantaneous rate of change, I will do an example in form of the derivative of the function. Right? Um, okay, so let's uh, recall average rate of change quickly. Here is an example. Let's say compute the average rate of change for the function f of x equal to let's say x square minus x plus 3 on the region 0 to 3. Remember how we compute average rate of change? The formula to compute average rate of change is pretty simple. It is f of b minus f of a over b minus a, where a is the left end point of the interval, b is the right end point of the interval. All right. It's a very simple formula. All you have to do is evaluate your function at the left end point, sorry, at the right end point of the interval, evaluate your function at the left end point of the interval. Take the difference and then divide it by the length of the interval. Whatever number you are going to get, we call it average rate of change. All right. I recommend that you do this computation in the numerator on a side. Let me throw the values in. I get f of 3 minus f of 0 over 3 minus 0. As I said, I recommend you evaluate f at 3 and f at 0 on a side and also compute their difference on a side. So f of x is x square minus x minus plus 3. f of 3, this is going to be 3 square minus 3 plus 3 and that is 9. f of 0, this is going to be 0 square minus 0 plus 3. And if you add those numbers, you get 3. Let's compute their difference, f of 3 minus f of 0, right? This is 9 minus 3, and it is 6, all right? Plan is very simple. I wanted to replace that difference by its simplification, 6. Let's do that. I get 6 divided by 3 minus 0, that's 3. So average rate of change for this function on the interval 0 to 3 is really 2. Okay, I want you to recall that uh, instantaneous rate of change at x equal to a, we have two more names for this quantity, right? Either you call it instantaneous rate of change at x equal to a or you call it slope of the tangent line.
at a f of a or you call it the derivative of the function at a these all three things they have the same meaning mathematically these three things are exactly the same same thing either you call it derivative of your function at a or you call it slope of the tangent line at a comma f of a or you call it instantaneous rate of change for your function at x equal to a these three things they are exactly the same thing let's try to see how we can you know we compute the derivative of the function at given input or we compute instantaneous rate of change for a function at a given a value or we compute slope of the tangent line at a f of a. Here is the question. Let's say find the derivative of this function f of x equal to 2 over x. using the limit definition and evaluate it at x equal to 3. All right. Another way to ask the same question is following. Compute instantaneous rate of change for 2 over x at x equal to 3. Or I can ask the same question this way too. Find the slope of the tangent line to the function f of x equal to 2 over x at point 3 comma 2 over 3. All right. So all these three things requires you to do the same computation. It really requires you to compute the derivative of the function at x equal to 3. Okay. Let me show you the computation. So here is the limit definition of derivative. A prime at x is limit h approaching to 0 f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. All right. Since I am going to evaluate the derivative at 3, I'm going to plug x equal to 3 into this formula. Let's plug it in. I get f prime x equal to limit h going towards 0, f of 3 plus h minus f of 3 divided by h. Again, for faster computation, I strongly, strongly recommend you guys to do this computation on a side, right? Compute f at 3, f at 3 plus h, compute their difference. Try to simplify that difference as much as you can, right? And then substitute that simplified value in the numerator. Let's do that. So f of x is given. I'm going to do it here. f of x is 2 over x. Now, f at 3, this is going to be 2 over 3. f at 3 plus h, this is 2 over 3 plus h. As you know, we are interested in computing the difference. So let's compute that difference of f of 3 plus h minus and f of 3. Right? This is 2 over h 3 plus h minus 2 over 3. Recall how we handle rational expressions. To handle rational expression, we find the least common multiple or common denominator of all these rational expressions. And once we have it, we make it visible under both terms and then we simplify the numerator. Right? Let's do that. The common denominator is a product of 3 and 3 plus h. To make it visible under the first term, I'll multiply and divide the first term by 3. To make it visible under the second term, 
I'm going to multiply and divide it by, uh, divide the second term by 3 plus h. So this is what we get. In the top, I get 2 times 3, which is 6, and then 2 times 3 plus h. Simplify the expression in the top a little bit, right? You would like to take care of like terms. I get 6 minus 6 minus 2h divided by 3 plus h, the whole square. 3 plus h times 3. Right? Notice the cancellation of 6. So I really get 2h divided by 3 times 3 plus h. This is the simplest form of the difference in the numerator of that derivative formula. Now, it's time to substitute that into our definition. Again, understand why I ask you to compute this difference and simplify, simplifying it on a side, right? Um, this really means that uh, you don't want to write those five lines with each in the denominator and limit symbol in the front. The computation also looks a little tedious if you do that, right? So always make a habit of uh, computing that difference in its simplest form on a side, okay? That way these examples can be solved way, way faster. I get limit h going towards zero, and then I have negative 2h divided by three times p plus h divided by h. Now understand that uh, this is the denominator of the expression in the top. It's a genuine denominator. You need to drop it down with h. Understand that uh, limit definition of derivative represent an indeterminate form of the limit. Right? If you plug h equal to 0 in here, you should get 0 in the top, 0 in the bottom. All right? So let's drop this uh, uh, numerator down. We get limit h going towards 0, negative 2h divided by three times h times three plus h. All right. Okay. Notice that this is still an indeterminate form. However, the problematic portion is already there as a factor. We did algebraic simplification to make that factor visible in the numerator. In the denominator, that problematic portion was already there as a factor, right? Once it is visible as a factor, get rid of it, right? And then you apply the limit. I get limit h goes to 0, negative 2 over 3 times 3 plus h. Plug h equal to 0. Yes, the problem is gone. We are safe. It is safe for us to apply the limit. I'm plugging h equal to 0 and be sure when you apply the limit, you should drop the limit symbol, right? I get negative 2 over 3 times 3 and that's negative 2 over 9. And that is the derivative of this function when x is equal to 3. Or it is an instantaneous rate of change for the function 2 over x at x equal to 2, x equal to 3 or it's a slope of, a ten, of the tangent line at 3 comma 2 over 3, all right? Okay, if you remember, after this, we discuss basic differentiation rules. We have set of nine wonderful differentiation rules that allows us to differentiate four important form of the function. Any function must be visualized in exactly one form out of these four forms. Let me remind you what these four forms are and uh, which rule to use in order to begin the differentiation process. All right? It is extremely, extremely important that you know how to read the function or how to visualize your function. All right? Number one. Your function may be identified as sum of terms. If your function is in form of sum of terms, 
then you use term by term differentiation meaning find the derivative of the first term second term third term and so on and then add the results right so if your function is in form of sum of terms use uh, term by term differentiation now if your function is in form of factors something multiplied by something this is something that's very easy to identify if you see two things being multiplied together to form a function then you need to start your differentiation process using the product rule all right or your function is weavable in form of factors sorry in form of ratio something divided by something this is perhaps the easiest form to identify right if this is how your function looks like then you need to begin the differentiation process using the quotient rule and if your function is in form of layers something raised to the power something or e raised to the power some expression of x or natural log of some sum of various x power terms right if your function is in form of layers then you need to begin the differentiation process using the chain rule right so four forms of the function right sum of terms or factors or ratio or layers depending on what is the initial form of your function you define you you begin you select particular rule to begin your differentiation process let me mention that one function can be visualized in exactly one way out of this four it is not possible that you visualize one function in form of sum of term as well as factors this is not going to happen all right so one function can be identified in exactly one form now keeping that in mind let's try to see a series of examples i would like to give you four or five different example to show you all these four types of uh, uh, four representation of function so let's recall <coughs> this idea by a series of examples So here is a common instruction. Let's say find the derivative for each of the following function. Here is number one. Let's say I give you this function f of x equal to x cube plus 5 over x cube plus cube root of x minus 8 over cube root of x all right so you see this is a function that i created by adding four terms right this function can be identified as a function in form of sum of terms four terms are being added to create this function all right so i need to do term by term differentiation okay decide what rule are you going to use to find the derivative of each of this term looks like this is a power of x so i am going to use the power rule this is also power of x power of x and power of x looks like i need to use power rule for differentiation to find the derivative of all these four terms power rule is easily applicable if you rewrite your function in such a way that all x term leaves in the numerator let's try to rewrite this function in such a form i'm going to rewrite the all four terms in this particular form where all power of x term are leaving in the numerator power of x are leaving in the numerator if there is a fancy notation given 
you would like to replace those fancy notation by the actual numerical power. Now apply the power rule. Here is the derivative of the function. Derivative of x to the 3 is 3x three to the 2. Derivative of x to the negative 3, that's negative 3, x to the negative 3 minus 1. Derivative of x to the 1 third is 1 third x to the 1 third minus 1. Make a habit of writing that minus 1 in form of a common denominator over common denominator. This is going to make the computation somewhat faster. Also, when you bring the power in the front, try to write that power in the parenthesis. Right? So without the parenthesis, this will look a little weird and it often leads to uh, arithmetical errors. Right? So keep those uh, small things in mind. Okay, so I have I have differentiated all four terms using the power rule. All I have to do is simplify the numbers and we are done. Let's do that. I have 3x to the 2 minus 15x to the negative 4 plus 1 third x to the negative 2 third minus minus plus 8 over 3x to the negative 4 over 3. Right? And that is the derivative of the given function. And this is indeed the first form of the function. The function is viewable in form of sum of terms. Let's try another one. Here is number two. Suppose I give you f of x equal to 3x squared plus 7x plus 9 to the power 29. <coughs> All right. Again, I would like to first identify what is the form of this function that is going to help me uh, choose the correct integration, choose the correct differentiation rules, right? Okay, so first and foremost, understand that this is not, this is a function that is not in the form of sum of terms. We can't really see all the terms separate from each other in terms of their addition and subtraction, right? So then I ask the second question, is this in form of product, something multiplied by something? Answer is no. Is this in form of ratio, something in the top, something in the bottom? Answer is no. Then I arrive at the last question, is this in form of layers? Well, something raised to the power something. Look at that. It is a function in form of two layers. Identify the layers of your composite function. What's inside is called inner layer. What's outside, that exponent, is called the outer layer of the composite function. All right. I need to apply the chain rule to find the derivative of this function. Now remember, chain rule goes by its name. We are going to create the chain of the derivatives of every single layer of the composite function, beginning with the most outer layer. This function has two layers, so its derivative consists of chain of two derivatives. Derivative of the outer layer multiplied by derivative of the inner layer. If the function has five layers, Chain rule indicates that the chain should consist of five different derivatives, derivative of every single layer, starting from the most outer one, right? Okay, so uh, pretend in order to differentiate the outer layer, pretend that instead of inner layer, you have variable x. This should look like x to the power 29 to you, right? The question is, do we know how to find the derivative of x to the 29? Answer should be yes. Power rule, right? Bring 29 in the front, reduce one power of variable x. Do exactly the same thing, but with this inner layer, right? So let's do that. So I'm going to bring 29 in the front. I will reduce one power of the inner layer understand that this is the first derivative 
in that chain, it's the derivative of that outer layer, the 29 power of the inner layer. To complete the chain, I need to multiply this by the derivative of the inner layer. So all I have to do is find the derivative of that inner layer, 3x squared plus 7x plus 9, and done, right? Again, intentionally, I am writing this solution in two lines. I know that most of you are able to write down this answer just in one line. Totally fine if you do that. Um, now, think about it, how to get rid of this derivative notation. I'll have to use power rule, power rule, and constant rule, right? This bracket inside expression, I visualize it as sum of terms. If it's sum of terms, you need to do term by term differentiation, right? Let's do that. I get <coughs> 29 times 3x squared plus 7x plus 9 raised to the power 28 multiplied by derivative of 3x square is 6x, derivative of 7x is 7, and derivative of 9 is 0. Done. This is the derivative of the given function. The function is in form of layers, so we need to use the chain. Okay. Let me give you another illustration. Here is number 3. Suppose I give you this function f of x equal to x to the power 5 plus 4 plus natural log of 7x squared plus 9 plus e to the power 3x squared plus 4. All right. So again, we begin with the same idea, right? I need to know what is the initial form of this function. This is a function that I visualize as sum of four terms. One, two, three, and four. Four terms are being added to produce this function. So I need to do term by term differentiation. Decide what rule are you going to use to find the derivative of each term. Look, power rule for x to the power 5, constant rule for the second term, the third term is in form of two layers. I need to use the chain rule, formulation of logarithmic function there, right? And that fourth term, this is also in form of layers. So I need to use the chain rule there as well, right? Identify the layers of both composite functions. Right? Of course, you don't have to... Uh, write down the layers. You don't have to label the layers by inner layer and outer layer. Since this is the first preview problem, I'm labeling them, right? But you don't have to do that on the exam, okay? So I'm going to use power rule, constant rule, chain rule, chain rule. And whatever I'm going to get, I'm going to add them all to get the derivative of the function. Let's do it. <clears throat> Look. Derivative of x to the 5 is 5 times x to the 4. Derivative of that constant 4 is 0. Let's create the chain of the derivative of these two layers. First layer log. Derivative of that first layer, outer layer, will be 1 divided by inner layer. And then times derivative of the inner layer, which is 14x plus 0. Right? And then derivative of e to the inner layer is e to the inner layer itself multiplied by the derivative of the inner layer, which is 6x. Right? So this is what we get. You are not required to simplify your answer. However, it is recommended that you write each term in its simplest form. Tough grader may take points off if you don't simplify. Uh, every single term, right? So if there are two numbers sitting in the same term, you are expected to multiply them, okay? All right, so I get 5x to the 4 plus 14x divided by 7x squared plus 9 plus 6x times e to the 3x squared plus 4. And that is the derivative of the given function. 
So understand that out of four forms of the function, we have seen two of them. Sum of terms and then function in form of layers, and that's a combination of both, right? Okay, uh, let's try to see the remaining two uh, forms of the function in terms of two more examples. So here <clears throat> is number four and five. Let's say I give you this function f of x equal to x cubed plus x plus 5 to the power 25 times e to the power x squared plus 9. And then we have, let's say, f of x equal to log of x cubed plus 7 divided by x squared plus 5 x plus 2 and maybe let's add one more example f of x equal to e to the power 2x plus 3 divided by 4x plus 5. <coughs> Once again the idea is pretty clear we would like to read our function first we would like to identify what is the initial form of our function and that helps us begin the differentiation process all right so let's do that for the first function it is clear that this function is produced by multiplying two things this third degree polynomial x to the power 25 and that exponential term, right? If function is in form of factors, then you need to start the differentiation process using the product rule. Product rule we apply it in two simple steps. Set up the product rule formula and then eliminate the derivative notations. Right, so this is what we are going to do. Let's do it. Okay, so this is the first factor. This is the second factor. I'm going to rewrite this as u times v plus v times u prime. Let's do it. F prime x. Let's set up the product rule formula. The first factor, I'm going to leave it alone. I'll multiply it by the derivative of the second factor. So second factor prime. And now I leave the second factor as this. I multiply it by the prime of the first factor. Okay. Now think about it. <coughs> what it takes of this derivative notation and this derivative notation. In order to get rid of this derivative notation, you will have to identify that bracket inside expression in one of those four forms. Understand that this is a function in form of two layers. You need to use the chain rule to get rid of that derivative notation. Same way, this is also a function in form of two layers. You need to use the chain rule to get rid of that derivative notation. Let's do that and write down the final answer. Most of the times, product rule and quotient rule, whenever they are involved in the computation, it is basically two to three line work, all right? Okay, let's do that. I get x cubed plus x plus five raised to the power 25. Derivative of e to the inner layer is e to the inner layer multiplied by the derivative of the inner layer. Right, so e to the x squared plus 9 times 2x plus e to the x squared plus 9 derivative of expression of x raised to the power 25. This is going to be 25 inner layer to the power 24 times derivative of this inner layer. Derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. Derivative of x is 1. Derivative of 5 is 0. 
As I mentioned earlier, there is no need to simplify your answer, meaning this is our final answer. All right, it is indeed two line work. Let's try the second example now. And in the next example, as you see, the function is in form of ratio. Something is in the top, something is in the bottom. I must use the quotient rule to find the derivative of this function. We apply quotient rule exactly in the same way. Two steps. Step one, set up the formula. Step two, eliminate the derivative notations. Let's do it. Okay. So here is a prime of x. Denominator times derivative of the numerator minus numerator times derivative of the denominator. This is divided by the square of the denominator. <coughs> Right? Think about it. What it takes to get rid of those two derivative notations. To eliminate this derivative notation, you'll have to use the chain rule because this is a function with two layers. To eliminate this derivative notation, you will need to use the power rule, power rule, and constant rule. This is a function in form of sum of three terms. Term by term differentiation is what we need to use. Let's use it. We get x squared plus 5x plus 2 derivative of log of the inner layer is 1 over inner layer times derivative of the inner layer. So 3x squared over x cubed plus 7 minus I have log of x cubed plus 7 derivative of those three terms are going to be 2x plus 5 plus 0. And this is divided by the square of the denominator. <clears throat> As mentioned earlier, there is no need to simplify your final answer. This is perfectly fine as a final answer. Now, in that last example, it should be clear that this is a function in form of two layers. You need to start the differentiation process using the quotient, using the chain rule, right? If you use the chain rule, you get derivative of e to the inner layer is e to the inner layer itself times derivative of the inner layer. Ask a question that what should be done to get rid of that derivative notation? To get rid of this derivative notation, I'll have to read this function in form of one of those four, four things. This is clearly function in form of ratio, something divided by something. To eliminate that derivative notation, I must use the quotient rule. We do it in two steps, right? Set up the quotient rule and then eliminate the derivative notation. Let's do that. So bottom times prime of the top <coughs> minus top times prime of the bottom over the bottom square. Get rid of those two derivative notations and we are done. We need to use the power rule and the constant rule. We have 4x plus 5 times derivative of 2x plus 3 is 2 and then 2x plus 3 times derivative of 4x plus 5 is just 4. No call derivative signs are gone. This meaning this is the final answer. All right. So understand that the function can be seen only in one way out of these four possible forms. And depending on the initial form of the function, we choose the particular differentiation rules. We begin differentiation process using that rule and that rule will lead us what else is needed. <clears throat> now, let me remind you 
the fact that log is the greatest simplifier in mathematics. And we say that because of its properties, right? Let's try to see one example recalling it. Suppose I give you this function, let's say find a prime x for this function f of x equal to let's say natural log of 7 x to the 10 times square root of 2x plus 3 times 3x plus 1 to the power 8 divided by e to the x square plus 5 times 2x plus 7 to the power 7. Okay. Now understand that uh, we can still use the old idea, right? That, uh, that our usual technique. Read this function. Identify what is the form of this function. This function is in form of layers. The outer layer is log. Inner layer is that messy ratio. Right? Okay. So if I don't use the logarithmic rules, then just understand what rules do I need to use. I need to start with the course with, with the chain rule. Derivative of that outer layer will be one divided by that ugly expression, right? To complete the chain, I will need to multiply that expression by the derivative of this ratio. Now, derivative of this ratio requires you to use the quotient rule once, product rule three to four times, and then the chain rule at least 10 to 12 times. It's a lot of computation. Right? It is a computation that uh, cannot be done in less than 10 minutes. Right? So more than 10 minutes is needed to compute the derivative of this function if you are really good in uh, computing derivatives. Right? If you choose not to use logarithmic rules. Right? Logarithms are greatest simplifiers in mathematics because of their properties. Their properties have tremendous power to eliminate some serious computation from derivatives, all right? Remember, we have, <clears throat> let me remind you those properties. If you have product of two mathematical expression and you have log in the front, you can break this log into two separate logs, log of the first expression plus log of the second expression. Now look at uh, uh, the left side and the right side of this equation and you will understand uh, what this rule is going to do with the computation of derivative. Left side has the inner layer a times b, outer layer log. So in order to differentiate inner layer, you will have to use the product rule. But if you choose to use the logarithmic rules, the product is gone from the inner layer of the composite function. Now you have two separate logs where inner layer does not have product. This rule can help you eliminate the product rule from the computation of derivatives. Okay. All right. Let's try. Recall the next rule. We have natural log of A over B. We have a ratio of two mathematical expression. You can break that log into two pieces as well, right? Natural log of the expression in the top minus natural log of the expression in the bottom. Okay. All right. <clears throat> and then um, if you have k power of the mathematical expression and you have log in the front, you can bring k in the front, right? First property can help you eliminate the product rule from the computation of derivative. If inner layer in your logarithmic function is in form of factors, those factors can be uh, converted into sum of individual terms. If your function 
if your logarithmic function has a ratio as an inner layer, then that ratio can be converted into the difference of two logarithmic terms. If you have a power of the expression, the power can be moved in the front. So this can eliminate product rule from the computation. This one will eliminate the quotient rule from the computation of derivative and this will eliminate chain rule from the computation of derivatives. And then we have a fact that logarithmic function and exponential function, they are inverses of each other. I think the fact that graph of the logarithmic function cuts the x-axis at 0 0.10. Natural log of 1 is 0 in other words. Okay. All right. What I want you to do is compute number of distinct factors inside that inner layer of your composite function. All right. Looks like inside the inner layer, we have 1, 2, 3, four factors in the numerator and two factors in the denominator. Altogether, I have six factors that are part of the inner layer of this composite function. This number six represent exact number of pieces that I can get for my logarithmic function. Each factor will get its own copy of log. The factors in the numerator, they will be associated with positive sign, the factors in the denominator will get negative sign, okay? Keeping this in mind, let's break this down into six pieces. Log of the first factor in the top plus log of the second factor in the top plus log of the third factor in the top plus log of that fourth factor in the top. All four factors in the top are being taken care of. Now I have two factors in the bottom, they will have negative sign in the front. So minus natural log of that fifth factor, which is in the bottom, and then minus natural log of 2x plus 7 raised to the power 7. Look, <clears throat> I have broken that complicated log into six pieces. These six pieces, they are much easier to handle in terms of derivatives. Term by term differentiation is always faster compared to, you know, using the product quotient rule or any combinations, right? Okay, move all the powers in the front. Every time you move the power in the front, you will eliminate use of the chain rule ones. Five powers will be shifted, meaning I can eliminate use of the chain rule five times. Look, I get log seven plus 10 log x plus half log 2x plus b plus 8 log dx plus 1 minus x squared plus 5 times log e. Remember log e is 1 minus log of 2x plus 7. I'm going to replace that log x by uh, log e by 1. I get log 7 plus 10 log x plus half log 2x plus 3 plus a log 3x plus 1 minus x squared minus 5 minus 7 log 2x plus 7. We are saying that we have two ways to write down our function. Either we write our function in form of a single complicated log or we can write our function in form of some of these seven terms. The difference is crystal clear. Computation of derivative of this version requires 10 to 15 minutes, even more than that. Computation of derivative of this seven term requires less than 30 seconds. Let's apply the basic differentiation rules to compute f prime x. Derivative of log seven. Understand that seven is constant. If you input seven in your calculator and punch ln button, you will get a constant number. So log 7 is constant, right? Derivative of a constant is 0. Derivative of log x is 1 over x. Derivative of log of 1 over, log of 2x plus 3 is 1 over 2x plus 3 times 2. Derivative of log of 3x plus 1 is 1 over 3x plus 1 times 3. 
derivative of x square is 2x, derivative of y is 0, derivative of log of 2x plus 7 is 1 over 2x plus 7 times 2. As I said, you are not required to simplify your answer. However, you need to make sure that each term is in its simplest form, meaning if there are two or more numbers sitting in the same term, you are expected to multiply them. You may receive a reduced point if you don't do that. Okay. So look, simplify those numbers. I get 10 over x plus 1 over 2x plus 3 plus 24 over 3x plus 1 minus 2x minus 14 over 2x plus 7. All right. Check the computation. There is no trick. It's a wonderful, wonderful way to see log is the greatest simplifier in mathematics, right? And it's all because of its uh, fabulous properties, right? Okay, <clears throat> now let's move on and let's recall those three interesting ideas. The idea of the cut point that we used in three different settings, right? If you remember, cut point of the function, if you want to find out the cut point, you will have to set the numerator and the denominator of the expression equal to zero, and you will need to solve it for variable x. Let me first remind you this whole thing in form of that big picture. Right, so we use cut points in three different settings. We use the cut point of the function. Remember, cut point of the function, they help us using solve, they, they help us to solve inequalities. Right. So if you want to solve inequalities like where is f greater than zero, where is f of x less than or equal to zero, where is your function greater than or equal to zero. To solve this type of inequalities, you will have to use the cut point of the function. Right. Then we use cut point of derivatives. Right. We use cut point of the derivatives in this. Um, to, to calculate, to compute increasing, decreasing intervals and to find relative maximum and minimum. If the question asks you to find relative maximum and minimum or increasing and decreasing intervals, then you must use the cut point of f prime x. Again, the definition of cut point remains the same. If you want to find cut points of f prime x, you find the derivative of the function and then set the numerator and the denominator of f prime x equal to zero. Solve for x, whatever x values you get call them cut point of f prime x. Remember, those cut point of f prime that also are in the domain of the function, we call them critical points. Critical points means they are one of the most important points in differential calculus. They represent many, many practical applications. Okay. All right, uh, then we talk about uh, cut point of the second derivative. This is something that we use to compute concavity intervals. And inflection points. Right. So this is a big picture of uh, how we use the 
notion of cut points to handle three different properties of the function, right? Derivatives help us understand the shape of the graph of the function. Sketching the graph of the function could be tedious, right? So that is the reason why we need help from calculus there. Okay, uh, let's recall all these three things by one example each. And I will try to give you one quick example. You can try more examples from your weekly paper homework assignments and this additional practice problem set that I have posted for section 5.3. Right. So here is the first example. Let's say I give you a function for f of x equal to x squared minus x minus 6 divided by x minus 7. For this function, I would like to answer the following question. Find all cut points of f of x. Be sure you read the first question correctly. All right. If the question says find the cut point of f of x, you need to set the top and the bottom of the originally given function equal to zero. If it says find the cut point of f prime x, then you find the derivative of your function and then set up and the bottom equal to zero. If the question says find the cut point of the second derivative, then compute the second derivative and then set the top and the bottom equal to zero. Okay, so if this logic is clear in your mind, then it's going to, the set of problems are going to be very, very simple. Okay, number two, Give the sign chart of f of x by plus and minus sign on the number line. Indicate where your function, how your function changes its sign. Number three, <clears throat> um, give intervals where the function is positive. When I say function is positive, I'm asking you to solve if f of x greater than zero. Positive entries, they are the entries bigger than zero. They resides to the right of zero on the number line. Give the intervals where function is negative. Negative numbers, they are to the left of zero. Right? So I'm asking you to solve f of x less than zero there. And then final question, solve for f of x greater than or equal to zero. Understand how to read this. Function is greater than or equal to zero. I want you to answer these two questions. Where is your function positive or zero? You need to combine those two things to answer that last question. Now, remember, we answer this question in four simple steps. Step one, compute the cut point of the function. Step two, puncture the number line by the cut point of the function and get the test interval. Step three, create a table involving step function um, test x sorry create the table involving uh, test intervals test x value and then sign of the function and then step four use this table to answer all the questions about your function okay remember we use this similar process for uh, increasing decreasing intervals as well as concavity intervals let's try it quickly so here is the solution <clears throat> so i have f of x equal to 
x square minus x minus 6 divided by x minus 7. Okay, for cut points, of f of x, you set the numerator equal to 0 and then the denominator equal to 0. And then you solve each of these equation for variable x. Let's do that. As you solve this equation for variable x, you'll get x equal to 3, x equal to negative 2, and x equal to 7. Now, we, when you are solving inequality, it is very important that you keep in mind that the zeros of the numerator, they represent x value for the x intercept. These are the x value where the graph of your function is going to cut the x axis. Meaning, these are the good cut points. These are the cut points where your function has value 0. Right? Now, that zero of the denominator, it represents vertical asymptote in the graph of your function. And that is why it is a bad cut point. Okay? This is a bad cut point because it's a vertical asymptote. Division by zero is not possible. Right? First step is done. I calculated the cut points of my function. Step two. Puncture the number line by the cut point of the function. There are three cut points, negative 2, 3, and 7. The good cut points, I'm going to use a solid vertical line. For the bad cut points, I'm using the dotted vertical line. Right? Just to keep track of it. This is where my function is undefined. Okay. Now let's create that table with three rows. Test intervals. I have negative infinity. Let me draw this table. here because we'll need a little more room. Test intervals. I have four of them negative infinity to negative two. Negative two to three. Three to seven and then 7 to infinity. Pick test x value. As I said, you can select any value you like. The only restriction is the value must be part of that test interval. So select anything between negative infinity and negative 2. Let me select negative 3 here, 0 here, 4 here, and then maybe 8 here, right? I need to know the sign of my function. Right? The sign analysis can be done faster if you work with the factors. Look, the factorization of the numerator is x minus 3x plus 2. The factorization of the denominator, it is going to be x minus 7. Right? Use these factors to determine the sign of uh, your function. Plug x equal to negative 3 and decide the sign of each factor. Remember, we are only interested in the sign, not the answer, right? Negative 3 minus 3 is negative. Negative 3 plus 2 is negative. Negative 3 minus 7 is negative. All three factors are negative. Product of three negative entries going to be negative, all right? Plug x equal to 0, 0 minus 3 negative, 0 plus 2 positive, 0 minus 7 negative. 
product of two negative and one positive factor turns out to be positive. X equal to four gives me four minus three, that is positive. Four plus two is positive. Four minus seven is negative. Two positive factor, one negative factor, the product will be negative. Look, X equal to eight. 8 minus 3 positive, 8 plus 2 positive, 8 minus 7 positive. All factors are positive. The product will be positive. Right? If you copy the third row on the number line, what you get is called the sign chart of the function. This is how the sign of your function changes over the number line. Right? We are ready to answer all the questions now. So this is step number three. <clears throat> so final step, time to answer all these questions. Find all cut points of the function. There are three cut points. I have negative two, three, and seven. Out of them, seven is a bad cut point. Okay. Sign chart of the function is right there. Give the interval where function is positive. The function is positive on the second test interval and on the fourth test interval. Let's write it down. Negative 2 to 3 and 7 to infinity. Right? Function is negative on negative infinity to negative 2 and 3 to 7. Right? Now, main question. Where is your function positive or zero? Now I need to combine two things. Where is your function positive? The function is positive on these two intervals. Where is it zero? It is zero at the good cut point of your function. Right? Combine these two things together. In this answer, you would like to include 3 and negative 2. All right. Use the bracket around these two values to make sure that they are included. Right. So I'm going to write down this answer, but by including negative 2 and 3 both. 7 is a bad, bad cut point. We cannot include it. Right. So see, that is the final answer. Again, very simple and clean idea, right? Find the cut points of function. <clears throat> give the sign chart of the function, give the interval where it is positive, where it is negative, and where it is greater than or equal to zero. Understand that we solve three types of inequality related to this function by using this simple looking procedure, right? Let's recall the same idea that we use for the cut point of f prime x to compute increasing decreasing intervals and relative maximum and minimum. Okay, so let's say I give you a function. Okay, let's say I give you this function for f of x equal to <clears throat> 2x cubed minus 3x squared minus 36x plus 4. For this function, we would like to answer the following question. Find all cut points of f prime x. Now, as I say, read the first question carefully. Question is asking you to compute the first cut point of f prime x. Number two, give the sign chart of f prime x with the plus and minus sign. 
on a number line indicate how your function, how the derivative changes its sign. Give the slope chart. of the function, give intervals where function is increasing give intervals where function is decreasing There are two ways to ask this uh, last two question. Give x value for relative maximum or give relative maximum in the format x comma y. In other words, give the exact location of relative maximum on the graph of the function. To make it little faster, I'm go only going to ask for x value for now give x value for relative minimum. All right, so these, these are the set of questions we would like to answer now about my function. Should be clear that we need to use the cut point of f prime x, right? Let's use it. So here is the solution. We are again going to use the same four step method. Step one, compute the cut point of f prime x. Step two, puncture the number line by the cut point of f prime x, get the test interval. Step three, create a table involving test interval, test x values, sign of the derivative and conclusion for your function. And then step four, use the table and the first derivative test to answer all the questions. Okay, let's start. So here is your function, f of x is 2x cubed minus 3x square minus 36x plus 4. All right, let's find out f prime x first. So I get 6x square minus 6x minus 36 plus 0. The derivative of this function is straightforward, right? How do we find the cut points? For the cut points of a prime x, we need to set the numerator and the denominator of f prime equal to zero. There's nothing in the denominator, right? So I'm setting numerator equal to zero. Factor six out, you get x square minus x minus six equal to zero. I get x minus three, x plus two equal to zero. Understand that six has no role to make this product zero, right? The only thing that can make this product zero is either x minus three being equal to zero or x plus two being equal to zero. This tells me that x is three. This tells me that x is negative two, right? So these are the two genuine cut points of the function of the derivative that we get. Step two, let me create two copies of number line, one, for the sign chart of f prime, the other one is for the slope chart of function. Cut these two, cut the number line at those two inputs. All right. Okay, I get three test intervals one, two, and three. Let's use them. I get <clears throat> um, let's create that table. First row consists of test intervals. We have three of them, negative infinity to negative two, negative two to three, and then three to infinity test x value maybe negative 3 here 0 here and 4 here 
check the sign of f prime x. All right. For f prime x, I recommend you use the factor form. If it is clear in your mind that six has no contribution towards the final sign of f prime x, you can drop six from your sign analysis. I will only consider those two factors, x minus three and x plus two, that decides the final sign of f prime x. Plugging x equal to negative three will make the first factor negative, second factor negative, the product will be positive. Plugging x equal to zero gives me first factor negative, second factor positive, product will be negative. Plugging x equal to four will make both factors positive. The final product will take the positive sign. Ready to write down the conclusion for the function. If the slope is positive, the function is increasing. If the slope is negative, function is decreasing slope positive function is increasing the table is complete we are ready to answer all the questions right if you copy that third row on the number line you get the sign chart of f prime x this is how the derivative changes its sign if you copy the fourth row on the number line you get the slope chart of the function. This is how the function changes from increasing to decreasing on the number line. Right? Okay, let's answer all the question. Give all the cut points of the function. We have two cut points for f prime x, x equal to 3 and negative 2. Right? Sign chart of f prime x is right there. Slope chart of f prime and f of x is also there in the second step. Give the intervals where function is increasing. Looks like function is increasing on negative infinity to negative 2 and it is increasing on 3 to infinity. So let's copy that here. Negative infinity to negative 2 union 3 to infinity. It's decreasing only on one test interval negative 2 to 3 uh now time to answer the last two question use the first derivative test right if your function changes from increasing to decreasing you must have a maximum there if your function changes from decreasing to increasing you must have a minimum there you must know how to read the slope chart okay look at the slope chart Figure out what's happening at the candidates for relative maxima and minima. Function changes from increasing to decreasing. You must have a relative maximum there. Function changes from decreasing to increasing. So you must have a relative minimum there. All right. So there are two candidates. I classify one as a maximum, one as a minimum. Let's write it down. We have relative maximum at negative two, relative minimum x equal to 3. Okay. All right. So this is uh, the result that is using the cut point of a prime x, right? And we uh, use it to compute uh, increasing, decreasing intervals and relative maxima and minima. First derivative test was used to identify, to classify cut point of f prime as a maximum or minimum remember cut point of f prime represent most important points in differential calculus all right they have lots and lots of applications and this big result called the first derivative test uses the sign of the first derivative to do the classification of the cut point of f prime as maximum and minimum okay now let's see one example quickly to see how we can use the cut point of the second derivative to understand the concavity, all right, and inflection points. So let's say I give you the following function.
So let's say I give you this function f of x equal to um, x cube minus 6x squared plus 4x plus 5. For this function, we would like to answer the following question. Find all cut points of the second derivative. All right, again, as I said, read the first question carefully. Understand what is being asked. Cut point of the second derivative is what we need to compute. Uh, give the sign chart. of the second derivative. Give the concavity chart for the function. Give intervals where the function is concave upward. Give the intervals where the function is concave downward. And again, two ways to ask this uh, last question. Give x value for the inflection point or give the inflection point in the format x comma y. Right? To make it faster, I'm going to ask for x value for now. Give x value for inflection point. Okay. All right, let's apply the same four step process. Compute the cut points of the second derivative. Puncture the number line by the cut point of the second derivative. Second derivative, cut point of the second derivative are the candidates for inflection points, right? Once you get those test intervals, create the table with four rows. First row will be test interval, second row is test x value, the third row is the sign of the second derivative, and the fourth row is conclusion about the function, right? And then finally, use the table to answer all this question, right? Next row. So, <clears throat> here is the solution. First step, I need the second derivative of this function x cubed minus 6x squared plus 4x plus 5. f prime x, this is 3x squared minus 12x plus 4. I need the second derivative. So, second derivative is 6x minus 12. All right. Okay. How do we find the cut points? For well, cut points, of the second derivative, you set second derivatives numerator and denominator equal to zero. There's nothing in the denominator, right? So I'm setting the top equal to zero. Solve this for x. I get x equal to two, right? This is the only candidate we have for inflection point. Puncture the number line by this candidate. Again, I am going to create two copies of number line. One for the concavity chart, one for the sine chart. Right. Create that table with four rows. Test intervals negative infinity to 2 and then 2 to infinity. Pick test x value 0 and 3. We need to know the sign of the second derivative. You can use this version or its factor form. Let's use 6x minus 12. It's a linear entry. It's going to give a sign quickly anyways. Plugging x equal to 0 gives me negative 12. Second derivative takes negative sign on this test interval. Plugging x equal to 3 gives me 18 minus 12. That's positive. Let's write down the conclusion 
for our function. The function is concave downward here, concave upward here. If you copy the third row on the number line, you get the sine chart of the second derivative. This is how the sign of the second derivative changes on the number line. If you copy the fourth row on the number line, you get concavity chart of f of x. This is how concavity of the function changes on the number line. We are ready to answer all the questions. Find all cut points of the function. We have x equal to 2. Give the sign chart and concavity chart. They both are presented in, in step 2. Give intervals where function is concave upward. We have 2 to infinity. That's the only interval where it is concave upward. It's concave downward on negative infinity to 2. Right? To answer the last question, you must know how to read the concavity chart. See what's happening at the candidate. Is the concavity changing? Function changes from concave down to concave up at 2. So x equal to 2 is a genuine inflection point. All right? So again, you can find out more examples from the practice problem set that I have posted um, on e-learning. And I recommend you guys do more problems. I, I just wanted to show you one problem to recall the idea. We have used various different type of functions to do the concavity analysis to do uh, you know increasing decreasing analysis and to solve various inequalities right so try more examples okay. and if you find any difficulty please reach out to your class instructor or to me we'll be very happy to help you out okay now one final topic one final example Let's recall the idea of the second derivative test, right? Now, first derivative test and the second derivative test, they gives us the same information. They tells us about relative maxima and minima. They both are the classification technique for cut point of a prime x being max or min, right? So again, to classify cut points of a prime as a relative maxima or minima, we have two different techniques. Method number one is the first derivative test. You obviously look at the sign of the first derivative. That's why it's called the first derivative test. Here we are going to look for the sign of the second derivative to make that distinction. So we call it second derivative test. All right. So second derivative test and first derivative test, they both are tools to classify cut point of a prime x as relative maximum or relative min. So it does the same thing, right? It should be clear that uh, the second derivative test is a weaker test compared to the first derivative test. This is something that you guys should have seen in your uh, class. I don't want to get into much detail. This is the fastest way to recognize if the cut point of a prime is a maximum or minimum. However, it comes with the price, it has a limitation, right? It can only test those cut points that comes from the zero of the numerator. And there are exceptions that there are some zeros of the numerator whose, uh, which cannot testify. Uh, cannot be testified using the second derivative test, right? So it's a weaker test compared to the first derivative test. So if second derivative test gives you no result, then obviously you need to use the first derivative test, which is a stronger version, okay? The only reason why we are trying to use it is because it is uh, the fastest way to recognize 
uh, relative maxima and minima of the function. Let me give you one example, okay, just to end this story. So let's try to do the same problem that we did earlier. Um, let's say we have 2x cubed minus 3x squared minus 36x. And I don't remember what number I used, but let's use 4. All right. So we have calculated cut point of a prime x for this function. And we have used this increasing, decreasing intervals and the first derivative test to find out relative maxima and minima of the function. Okay. Let's uh, deal with the same function and ask these three questions. Number one, find all cut points of f prime x. Remember, they both are going to do the classification of cut point of f prime as a max or min. So you need to find the candidates first. So that is the first step. Compute cut point of f prime x. These are the candidates. Now, you can use two tools. Tool number one, sign of the first derivative. If you are using them, call it first derivative test. If you are using sign of the second derivative to do the classification, call it second derivative test. Right? So the second question is compute the second derivative of the function. All right. And then number three, use the second derivative test. To compute. For now, let me just ask for x value. X value for relative maximum and relative minimum. So this is the computation we are going to do in three simple steps. Step one, compute the cut point of f prime x. Step two, compute the second derivative of your function. This is the tool that we are going to use. Step three, one by one, throw the candidates into the tool, observe the sign of the second derivative, and make a conclusion about their nature, whether they are min, max, or nothing. Okay, let's do that. Again, for more examples, you can check the practice problem set that I posted on e learning. So we have f of x equal to 2x cubed minus 3x squared minus 36x plus 4. Let's find out the cut points of this function. I need to find the derivative first. So 6x squared minus 6x minus 36. For cut points of f prime x, I'm going to set that numerator equal to zero. And then I'll use the standard factorization technique to, you know, get all the cut points. Looks like we get x equal to three. And x equal to negative one. So these are the candidates for relative maxima or minimum. We don't know at this point which one is max and which one is min. We have to do that classification. Now for that classification, we have two methods, right? The first method is first derivative test, which requires you to puncture the number line by the cut points, get the test interval, obtain the sign of the derivative based on that mention whether your function is increasing or decreasing look at the slope chart which are basically sign of the first derivative right uh, and then you claim that uh, which cut point is what right now let's see what the second derivative test does in the second part i need to calculate the second derivative of the function let's differentiate this guy again Derivative of 6x squared is 12x 
derivative of negative 6x is negative 6 and derivative of that 36 is 0. Right? So I got the two, I got the candidates. Now, final step. I have two candidates and I will work with one by one. Right? Let's start with the first entry, x equal to negative 2. I'm going to throw that candidate into the two. And I need to observe the sign. Again, I'm only interested in the sign, not interested in the exact answer. Negative 24 minus 6. The answer will be negative. Sign of the second derivative is negative. Graph is concave down, meaning at the candidate, you must have a maximum value, right? So F has a relative maximum. At x equal to negative 2. Done. Do the classification of that next point for x equal to 3. Obtain the second derivative. Obtain the sign of the second derivative at 3. You get 12 times 3 minus 6. Understand that this is 36 minus 6. If you subtract the number bigger than 6 from 6, the result will be positive. Again, I am only interested in the sign. The sign of the second derivative at the cut point of f prime is positive. If second derivative is, is concave upward, if the graph is concave upward at the candidate, you expect a minimum value, right? So f has relative minimum at x equal to 3. If you want to find the exact location of them on the graph of the function, all you have to do is throw those two candidates into the original function and produce the y value and then write down your answer in form of x comma y all right so again uh, these are all the topics that uh, we covered between the first and the second exam as i mentioned earlier if you have any difficulty with any of these topics or if you need more examples, um, feel free to contact your class instructor or me. We'll be more than happy to help you out. Thank you so much.